morning, everybody. Again, so you've got to wake up a little bit after you worship. Steve, you look like you got a word for me. Okay, we're going to start the morning off correctly. The Lord said, if you will learn to love me and fully receive my love for you, obedience will follow as a byproduct of our shared love for each other. Then it will not be hard for you to obey me. It will no longer be a sacrifice. It will be your gift to me. I want to make your desires your practice. Set aside time to hear, then begin to listen to me. I have much I want to pour into you. I want you to sing of me and become bolder and share more freely the truths that you know and understand about me and my love. Trust me, I won't embarrass you. You have to be willing to risk making mistakes. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Isn't that the truth? Thank you, Steve. What's the saying? If you, if you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat, which means taking a risk. God's going to ask you to take risks sometimes, and, but you've got to be willing to do that. And sometimes, you know what? You're not going to get it right. Probably more times than not, but God's with you. But you know what your heart is. He will. And uh, that's actually what I want to talk about today. It's about humbling yourself before the Lord and preparing your heart. And as you do that, the Bible says the Lord will give you your heart's desires. And that sounds like a great verse. Everybody reads that and like, oh, right. But all too often you're thinking about your flesh desires, not your heart's desires. As you grow in your relationship with the Lord, and as I've learned, the Holy Spirit will minister to me, and God's desires will become my desires. So what God's pushing me to do and what I want to do is actually with the Holy Spirit telling me what he wants to do, because they're the same thing. Does that make sense? The more you're in relationship with the Lord, the more you grow with that, the more that becomes that's just a flow and an inevitability where God's showing me and pouring into you and as the Holy Spirit will give you your heart's desires because it's his desire that he's putting in you. It's supposed to be a natural flow. That's a good thing, by the way. All right? All right. Um, Today, I'm going to continue sharing on what I left off last week. I want to keep on this subject. Last week, I began to share on preparing your heart. And that may not sound super exciting, but to me, it's very exciting, and it's a very critical and important part of maturing as a Christian. Every person in here wants to grow in your relationship with the Lord. No one wants to just stay where you're at and not do anything. Am I right? We all want to grow. God has more for you, so if God has more for me, i am like, okay, sign me up. I want more. That's a good thing. Part of that is preparing your heart. One of the major pieces of growing and maturing in your relationship with the Lord is preparing your heart. Now, we think of prepare, there's lots of different preparations when you prepare something that's getting ready for something. But when you prepare your heart is fixing your attention towards God so that the Lord can speak to you and grow in you and input you so that his desires become your desires so that you can be an ambassador for Jesus and do what he wants you to do. See, it all goes around. It all goes back to having a relationship with Jesus. That's the whole point. That was God's plan A. There is no plan B. God's plan A for you was to be a God-inhabited being, not a human doing. In order to do that, I have to humble myself and allow the Holy Spirit to move through me and be, ask the Lord to make me usable instead of me trying to always do something to get God to bless me. It's the reverse. That's what the world teaches you. Instead, i got to say, God, you make me usable so I can do what you want me to do instead of doing something and go, God, you're blessed this. 
That's not the way it works. That might be a good thing, but that's not the way God works. God's plan is better than my plan. If I learn how to pay attention to the Lord more than me. So I said all that. I'm going to do a little catch up here, but in... Um, I, last week I taught on out of the second book of Chronicles, if you've ever read that. In the second book of Chronicles, there was a man named Rehobian, and uh, thank you, Wayne. In a, chapter 12, verse, what is it? Rehoboam. Rehoboam. See, you know it, right? Don't ask me to be an English teacher. I read it, but Rehoboam. He did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. I, last week, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I taught on that last week. You ought to watch it. It says he did evil. The reason why he did evil is because he did not prepare his heart towards the Lord. If you read further in the beginning of the chapter, he started out good. He raised an army up, and he was going to defend Jerusalem, and the prophet told him, no, don't do it. And he said, okay. He obeyed the Lord and sent a whole army home. And that takes some obedience. That was a hard thing to do. But he fell off, and he called, fell off the wagon. He left the Lord, and he began to go off of the beaten path, and he ended up becoming an evil man and, and sinning against the Lord because he didn't prepare his heart. In other words, he didn't keep his heart fixed on what God wanted him to continue doing. This is a very common thing I see in the church today in the United States. How often do people get excited about God? They get born again or they get a word from the Lord or they come to church once and they get all fired up and they get a little shot of faith and that's great for a week. And then life happens and you get busy and you forget and then you do this and you do this and before too long, six months later, you never heard of the person before. They just go off somewhere and you know, I don't know. Because their heart was not fixed or prepared towards God. That takes an effort on your part. My part is to make an attention and a focus to, yes, how do I fix and prepare my heart towards the Lord? It's a preparation. It takes an energy for you to keep your focus on Jesus, not just once 30 minutes on a Sunday. That's a good. That's what you're supposed to get an education through. This is where you learn and come as a family, like, oh, this is what I need. When you go home, then you go ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you do when you go home? That's the question. What do you do when you're driving your car? Or what do you do even worse? What do you do when you go to Walmart? That's the test. Do you keep your faith when you go out in public and do your chores and chairs and when someone cuts you off in the interstate? I see, I know how it goes. I live in the real world. How many times have we forgotten? It's easy to forget. The good news is God doesn't forget. And he's always there. He's right there waiting for you. You know, when you prepare something, you make a plan for something. Like if you prepare a meal, you got to do, it doesn't just happen. You've got to get all the stuff ready and chop to chop and make it all ready. Dinner just doesn't make itself happen. If you prepare to go on vacation or something, you gotta, everybody knows this. You've got to get all your stuff out and you plan and you do this. That's preparing. You can prepare your heart in the same way to receive from God. You can prep or fix your focus on God so that God has the opportunity of your free will to flow through you and to reveal himself to you so that you can have a God influence on your life and get God results in your life. If you want God results in your life, you have to open your heart up to God to allow him to give you God results. You have a free choice. If you close that door, God is not going to kick that down. He loves you too much. He's not going to force you to do anything. You're the one that has to open the door. You know, when you guys get to the food bank opened up on Sunday, you guys, that's a lot of prep. You have to get things ready. The stuff comes in, you got to organize it, put it in all the paper. That's a lot of work. It doesn't just show up and it's there. Ladies, you know, when you, when you, all, when you have a, a child, it takes nine months 
The men just want the kid. They forget the nine months that it takes to get the kid there. But there's a lot of prep. It takes time and energy, and there's a whole process that goes through. It doesn't just show up. Likewise, when you're, that's just the same way God works. One step at a time, one step at a time. Turn over here to the book of Psalms. Let me share this with you. I shared this last week. Then I'll get into where we want to go. Yeah. David wrote this psalm. And David wrote, My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed, and I will sing and give song praise. David wrote that. And that word fixed is the same Hebrew word as prepared. That's the same word. My heart is fixed, which is focused. That same word is also you called established in the book of Hebrews. So you can prepare your heart. It's the same word as being fixed or focused, or you can be established. Once you make a decision in your life, in your heart, that I'm going to follow Jesus, that's an, you can be established and fixed and settled. Once you're focused on that, you're going to have opposition come your way. But when that comes, your decision-making process will become much easier because you've already pre-established your heart that I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And people are going to come and tell you, no, you don't want to do this, go do this, or you should do this or that. You're crazy, why are you doing this? All these things. But you can say, I, you're, I, my heart is fixed. I can't do that. I'm going to go this way. You know why this helped with David? Let me show you this. I'm going to show you a little story with you. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, flip over to 1 Samuel chapter 24 if you have your Bibles. David wrote that psalm highly based off of this incident in his life. He says, my heart is fixed, O Lord, my heart is fixed. One of the reasons he was able to overcome that is because David decided to fix his heart. God even said in the Psalms that David is a man after my own heart. Have you ever read that? That's the only time God ever mentioned a person after his own heart other than Jesus. So in chapter 24 of 1 Samuel, Samuel has been uh, exiled from Saul. And about a year after his exilation, uh, he f was hiding in a cave. And I'll read, I don't have verse 3 here, but I'll read. Oh, I do have verse 3. Okay. And uh, David's in a bad spot. He's been kicked out of the city, and he's a wanted man, and he has some people. So at the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul, king, the king Saul, went into a cave to relieve himself. This is the Bible talk, and I didn't make it up. <laughs> but as it happened, David and his men were hiding further back in that very cave. Verse 4, Now's your opportunity, his men whispered. Uh, his men whispered, Today the Lord is telling you, you will certainly put his enemy to power. This is his people telling David, God, the Lord is telling you right now that he will certainly put your enemy to power. This is other people telling David that the Lord is talking to them, talking to, to inform David to do as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. Verse 5. But then David's conscience got to, bo to bothering him, and because he had cut Saul's robe, he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this to the Lord the king. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. Verse 7. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. That is absolutely amazing. You hear this whole part about David's conscience being bothered him? You want to know why he was able to do this? This was David's perfect, perfect opportunity to end this whole desolation that lasted 13 years. This was only a year into it. I, thought I, might, I might be off a little bit. But for another 12 years or so, David had to run. If he would have just killed Saul then, he could have solved the whole problem 12 years early. But he didn't, and he actually had to restrain his men from killing Saul. You want to know how he was able to do that? Because of Psalm 57, verse 7, he says, My heart is fixed. And once he fixed his heart, he would not change his mind. He fixed his heart and says, That is God's anointed one, and I'm not going to touch someone that God anointed. That's, I'm not going to do it. 
If God does it, that's his problem. If, somebody, if he dies naturally, whatever, that's his problem. But I'm not touching him. Is everybody following me? He had the perfect opportunity. He says, nope, I can't do it. And all of his friends are back in the cave going, the Lord's going to deliver your enemy today. Go kill him. You should do this. What are you doing? Are you crazy? He says, I can't do it. The only way that's possible is because he prepared his heart. He decided to make a decision, and that decision stuck. Can you make your decision stick is the question. That's the real question. Can you make your decision stick? Once you make a decision, it's much, much harder for you to be tempted to go the other way. Once you decided to fix and prepare your heart and to focus and make a decision that I'm going to follow the Lord and this is what God has me do, it's going to be much, much more difficult for you to be tempted to fall off and go away from the Lord and go and do something that God doesn't want you to do because you made a decision just like David did. That doesn't mean people are going to try to get you to go off and do something weird. Well, the world is going to make you want to do that. Life is going to make you want to do that. You can't live 24 hours in this world nowadays and, got, and get, not get pulled in 15 other different directions. That's just the way the world works nowadays with all the technology and the cell phones and the fake news and all this other stuff going on. you got to pay attention. If you don't pay attention, it'll chew you up and spit you out. You won't even know what happened. That's why it's so important that we make a decision that i gotta, I got to fix my heart on the Lord. And I don't get it right all the time. But once I know one thing, I can find myself and catch myself and my thought process, and I can reel my, my brain back in, and reel yourself back in so you can go, okay, and then before you make a dumb decision and just fly off the handle, you can make a decision and go, okay, wait, 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 this isn't adding up. And you can tell yourself, what did I remember deciding? What would God, what does Jesus want me to do right now? What's my unction, like we talked about before? What is, what am I perceiving that I should do? And most of the time, God will tell you what, which way to go. God's always telling you which way to go if I'm willing enough to slow down enough and listen. I think that's good. I'm going to give you some scriptures today just to kind of reiterate this. Go to um, Hebrews. Let's go skip way over back to the other end of the Bible here. Go all the way to Hebrews. This is the same kind of point made from a different perspective. In Hebrews chapter 11, this is a really neat instance, and I like this scripture in verse 15. This is talking about Abraham and his wife Sarah when God called them out to leave their homeland of the Ur of Chaldees and go into the land of Canaan, and I'll make you a great nation. God promised them a great nation. And it says here in verse 15, talking about Abraham, if they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This is the King James translation, and it says, And truly, if they had been mindful of that country whence they came from, they might have had an opportunity to return. That is absolutely amazing. If you read that backwards, it basically says, If they remembered where they were from, they could have been tempted to go back. Let me see that again. If they had remembered where they came from, they could have been tempted to go back. But because they were not mindful, they were not tempted. In other words, you cannot be tempted to do something if you've never thought of it. <laughs> you can't be tempted to do something if you can't think it. If it's not in your brain, you can't do anything in your physical life without it first going through your imagination and your brain. If you've never thought of it, you can't do it. You can't even tie your own shoes without thinking about it. You've thought about it. You can't go anywhere unless you've thought about it. 
Abraham was so convinced and so fixed that he literally forgot where he came from. And he wasn't tempted to go back. And there's plenty of reason for him to be tempted to go back. If you look back in Genesis, I think it's chapter 7 and 8, when God called Abraham, he called Abraham when he was uh, 75 years old, if I'm correct, to leave his homeland. He said, leave your homeland, leave your family, leave your father and take Sarah and go to the land of the north. And Abraham did. That was a tough, tough decision. If you do a little more research, you'll find out this. His homeland, where he came from, is the exact homeland where Noah lived. Noah lived 950 years old. If you read the scriptures, it says he lived 350 years after the flood. You follow me so far? I'm giving you a little math. If you go through the genealogy and add it up, Abraham was born 240 years after the flood, which means Noah was still alive when Abraham was born. When Abraham left, he was 75 years old, which means Noah still had 70 years to live before he died. I'm putting all this together because it doesn't say in the scripture, but how many of you know if you lived in the same town as Noah did, you'd probably go see him? <laughs> Use your imagination a little bit. What would it be like to go sit around a campfire with Noah and have him tell you stories about the dinosaurs and stuff and all the, before the flood? Tell me you wouldn't do that. And you're telling me all the relatives, Shem and all his sons weren't there. You wouldn't see them. They've all been there for 780 years. They're still there. Tell me you wouldn't go visit those people. And God told you, pack up your stuff, leave it all, and forget about it. Would you do it? We all like to say we'd do it. But how many of us would get halfway there and go, hmm. What am I doing out here in the middle of nowhere? This is crazy. How many of us would be tempted to go back because we didn't fix our heart? That's a tough call. You got you to gotta use your imagination a little bit. Put yourself in Abraham's shoes. He was faithful, and God knew this so much so that he says I, he, he knew he needed to give Abraham a little shot in the arm, so to speak, to keep his faith up. And the way you do that is you use your imagination. Because your imagination is the key of everything that goes on in your mind. So what did he do? He told Abraham, look up in the stars. Count the stars. He says, no, I can't count them. Good. So the number of your descendants will outnumber the number of the stars. What, look down in the sand. Count the grains of sand. The number of your descendants will outnumber the grains of sand. You know why he did that? It's to keep... Abraham's faith operational and strong up that because Abraham lived out in the wilderness. Every night he slept out in the stars and saw the stars. He didn't have a roof with electricity and AC and, and bills. He slept outside. And he walked in sandals. They all had sandals. He walked and got sand in his toes and everything. He didn't have Nikes back then. Every single day he was reminded all day long of what God's promise was for him. You know what that does? That keeps your faith strong. And once you get that going, you build a momentum up, so to speak. Kind of like driving a car. You start out real slow, and as you go a little stronger, a little more, you get pick up speed. In your relationship with God, the more you fix your heart, the more you pick up speed, and the more God flows in your life, and the more you get confident, and the more your faith gets stronger and stronger and stronger, you make decisions and you see God move in your life, you pick up this momentum, and it gets harder and harder and harder for you to go veer off this and go this way and go away from God until at some point, hopefully in our life, your life, that you get to a point where that's almost impossible. I said this before. If you're driving a car 100 miles an hour, you can't just do a U-turn, not unless you want to die or spin. you got to slow the thing down and wait for the on-ramp and turn signal and hope the brakes work. If you're going 100 miles an hour in your relationship with God, you can't just do a wing turn and go rob a bank and go to jail. You don't want to know why? Because you're not thinking about it. Your brain doesn't even go there because you've never thought about it, so you can't do it. That's good. You can train yourself to be more God-dependent than you are independent. 
that leads me to where I want to talk to today. I always happen to do that. Go to the book of Psalms. I'll just read it up here. Psalms chapter 10, verse 17. Psalms chapter 10, verse 17. Most people hear the word humble and they, they think, ew, I don't want to do that. Because the world tells you that humble is weak or less than or lack of or all these different negative things when exactly the opposite is the true for the, for the Bible. Psalms verse 10, 17 says, Lord, thou hast heard the desires of the humble and thou wilt prepare their heart and cause thine ear to hear. The Lord has heard the desire of the humble and the Lord will prepare their heart and incline their ear. That is, a, you should put that on your refrigerator. This is a key. One of the major, major keys that I've learned to preparing my heart is to humble myself. And that is something that takes you to do. It says the Lord has heard the hearts of the humble. And it says this, look at this. The Lord will prepare your heart. The Lord's the one that does the preparing for you. You don't even have to do it. All you have to do is humble yourself towards God. And when you raise your little white flag and say, God, I want to be God dependent, not independent. What do you want me to do? Help me make me usable. God will actually do the work for you. That's why being a Christian is so awesome. Jesus did everything. He did all the hard work. He lives in you. He wants to build you up. All you got to do is say yes and thank you. He'll steer the ship, but you got to realize that you're in the ship and ask God, where do you want to go? He'll say, go straight or left. He will prepare your heart. Humility is not being low self-esteem or being less than. It has nothing to do with that. And there's a big difference between being humble and being humiliated. There's a totally different things. Is everybody following me so far? You can humiliate someone physically by saying something harsh or nasty to them and make someone by force succeed from that individual. That's different. When you humble yourself towards God, that just is meaning that you're becoming open and you're opening your heart and softening your heart to become teachable and usable so that God has something to work with. You have a free will choice. And like I said before, God's not going to push the doors down for you. I have to make the decision to say, God, here I am. What do you want me to do? And humble myself before God. There's so many scriptures on being humble towards the Lord. Um, we're going to share some of them today. But in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount. Has everybody heard the Sermon on the Mount? We'll do that sometime. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, verse 5, it says, God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. In one translation, it says, God blesses the meek, so they will inherit the earth. Mm -hmm. And everybody thinks the meek is someone that's poor or weak or infirmative or feeble or all these things, and that has nothing to do with anything. The word meek literally means teachable. A person who is teachable and humble or soft-hearted will inherit the earth. That's what he's trying to tell you in the Beatitudes. That's one of the Beatitudes. He's telling everybody that a person who is willing to open their heart up and let God do the driving will inherit the earth. A person who is willing to be teachable you are not the brightest light bulb in the box. I hate to say it. There's some smart people in here, but Jesus is smarter than you. Once I figured that out, that made life a lot easier. Once I figured out that if I ask for directions, God will tell me where to go. Meek means teachable and humble. I'm kind of shocked on the scriptures that you. Let me do another. Numbers chapter 12. 
In Numbers chapter 12, everybody read the book of Numbers and have it memorized? <laughs> I'm teasing you. Look at this. Now Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on the earth. Uh, another translation, it also says meek. It's the same word. The same word as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. The King James Version uh, translation says, Moses was the meekest man on the planet. Same word as Jesus said, humble and meek. They're interchangeable. So Moses was the most teachable man on the planet with the softest heart. That's how that reads if you want to translate it in today's modern English. You want to know some interesting fact? That's written in the book of Numbers. Does anybody know who wrote the book of Numbers? Moses wrote that about himself. <laughs> Moses wrote Numbers, and Moses wrote in himself, Moses was the most humblest man on the planet. Isn't that kind of interesting? The interesting part is God didn't correct him. God didn't say, what are you doing? He's all, uh, no. He, Moses was the meekest man on the planet, and he's the one that wrote that. Being humble will teach me and you to fear the Lord out of respect and honor. It's not a fear so much as being afraid that you're going to get struck by a bolt of lightning. I'm not talking about that. But the fear of the Lord, as the psalm says, is just to humble yourself towards God and acknowledge that God is God and there is no other God than God. Jesus is king and there is no other king. He is the Lord of lords. Jesus won. The fear of the Lord and a humble heart will actually prevent you from harm. It will actually prevent you from making bad decisions. A humble person, the Bible says that God will instruct his angels to look over you. You want to know how that works? A humble heart. A teachable heart. God will instruct his angels to look over you. And it says that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. A person that's proud, proud, pride, pride today has gone way off into la-la land in today's age. A proud person, it says God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. A person that thinks that I'll, I can do it, I'll fix it, and then God will bless it, or I can do it, God resists that. Because all you're doing at that point is shutting this valve off and telling God, I don't need you right now. I can do it. Here, watch me. Watch this. Watch what I can do. God is not going to bless that because you just stopped him from blessing you. He can't bless you because you told him no. Is this sinking in? 1 Peter chapter 5. I think that's what I just quoted. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5 and 7. I don't know if I have that one or not. Do I have that one? Let me read First Peter chapter 5. I'll read it. In First Peter chapter 5, verse 5, in the same way you younger must accept authority of the elders. Okay, I guess that puts me in a spot here. All of you dress yourselves in humility, there's the word humility again, and relate to one another as four. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and the right time he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries to the care of the God, for he cares about you. What pride does is the opposite of what humility does. It's just the same thing of what fear and faith does. They're opposites. Pride will actually harden your heart and shut the door for God's ability to bless you. It's not that God doesn't want to bless you, but if I turn my valve off and try to go my own way, make my own heart, and do my way, that will actually block the blessing of God in my life. And every person in the room has a little bit of that in here somewhere. We all, we're all on a stage of working through that and finding out. 
But once I understand that, now I can identify the areas of my life that I need to work on. If you don't know, you don't know. How are you supposed to fix something if you don't know what to fix? Am I going too fast? You guys writing notes? Let me share another one with you. In James chapter 4, if I can find James, chapter 4, there it is, verse 6, it says, He gives grace generously, as the scriptures say, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I wonder where we heard that before. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. I've said that. That's one of my favorite verses. But it all starts with humble yourselves before God. If you humble yourselves before God, it says, and resist the devil and he will flee from you. If you want the devil to flee from you, the way it works is, first of all, humbling yourself before God so God can flow through you. And once God's flowing through you, it says you resist the devil. You're the one doing the resisting. Once you do the resisting and God's flowing through you, the result is the devil will flee. Because he doesn't have the authority to make you do anything. You're the one. But the way it works is, you're the one that has to activate your authority in the power of God and move through the power of God. And the way God moves through you is for you to open that door and soften your heart and allow God to move through you. If you're a prideful person working, operating in pride, this isn't going to work. And you wonder, you can pray till the cows come home and, God, and the devil will just laugh at you. Does this make sense? Me and you are the ones that decide to do this, and it all starts with deciding to prepare your heart and making a decision that Jesus is my Lord, and I'm going to listen to what God wants me to do, regardless of what somebody else says. And it may sound weird sometimes. God may have you do things that you don't make any sense. How do you do that? Fix your heart. I'm going to give you two more scriptures. I'm going to Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. I'm just going to read it. It says, fix your thoughts on the Lord. Or do I have that? Now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent, worthy, and praise. That word fix is the same word as prepare. Prepare your thoughts on what is true. In other words, when you prep something, you're putting it all together. Your brain works like a little computer and it has a file system in it. You're the one that gets to organize the file system. Most of us don't have that. They just got a pile of stuff in there and you got to go kick through the floor and find out what's, in your, what's in, floating around in your brain. You can decide what you file. You can organize your thoughts in a fashion that what you decide to keep in your brain subconscious in your brain is only the good stuff that aligns with the Bible and you discard the rest. I think it was Billy Graham or uh, I can't remember who said it. He said, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from making a nest in your hair. You're never going to stop life problems coming through you, but you can decide how you deal with it and what do you keep and what you don't keep. People are going to get mad at you. You're never going to place in. You're never going to get everybody happy. You're going to have things happen in your life. You're going to go. Everybody has the same issues. No one here is exempt from life. Sorry. But you can decide to filter your thought process and focus on what God wants you to. And as you do that, we get better results. Everybody wants better results. The whole point of life is to get better at it not to get worse at it. I'm going to read you one more just to show you. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 
tells us. That's what I love about the Bible. It has answers for everything. You want to know how to do that? The Bible tells us. Oh, good thing, Ty. For we walk not by flesh, but not by the after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's talking about weapons now and how you produce a, a, a humility heart. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay. Casting down imaginations of every high thing that exalt itself against the knowledge of God and bringing them into captivity through the obedience of Christ. That's kind of old Englishy, but that basically says exactly what Philippians 4.8 the way you control your thoughts and become a humble heart is by casting down your imaginations. When you get something that comes in your imagination, you have the ability to say, no, that doesn't line up. And you have the power and authority to cast that down. And by doing that, you can bring into obedience your conscience and your heart to the Lord. And that's what the Bible calls preparing your Lord. Preparing your heart. That's how David was able to resist such temptations because his heart was fixed. That's one of the reasons why God told, everybody, told in Psalms that he is a man after my own heart because he was able to fix his heart towards God to such a degree that nothing deterred him. That's why Moses was the meekest man on earth. He was able to do that to such an extreme level that it was beyond anybody else on the planet. That he was, he was a humble person. Matter of fact, he was, he was so humble that the Lord told Moses, I want you to go and speak, speak to the people and I'll go with you. And Moses got caught off guard. He says, what do you mean you're going to go with me? If you're not going, I ain't going nowhere. He didn't say ain't. but He says, if you don't go ahead of me, I'm not going to go at all, period. End of discussion. That's how humble Moses was. He was so humble, he, didn't, he just wasn't going to move unless God moved first. That's what a humble heart is. Lord even told him, I'm going to go with you. And he's like, wait a minute, you weren't going to, was there ever a discussion that you weren't going with me? <laughs> he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. It's like, I'll do it. You, you go first and I'll go. If you don't go, I'm not going. That's a good attitude. I think it takes more practice for us than we think it does, though. But that's the attitude we should have. Is that helpful? Yes. It's helpful for me. I'm going to try something new here. I've never done this before. I'm going to use my cell phone. I looked at this. Either. Has anybody ever heard of a blue letter Bible? Yes. If you have it, you have it. You have it. If you don't have it, type it in your phone. It's free. Blue Letter Bible, B-L-T, B-L-B. It's a Bible app on your phone, and I use it quite often. It has lots of stuff, but here's what I did. I just typed in humble, and there's two pages worth of scriptures in the Bible that has the word humble in it, and that's a real neat tool. I'll read you a couple of them. You don't have to write them down. Just, I'll just read you a couple of them just to go through this. Psalms 18.27 says, For you will save the humble people, but bring down haughty looks. Psalms 25, 9. The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. Psalms 34, 2. My soul makes the best boast of the Lord, and the humble shall hear it and be glad. Psalms 69, 32. The humble shall see this and be glad, and you who seek the Lord, your hearts shall live. Psalm 147, 6. The Lord lifts up the humble and casts down the wicked. Psalm 149, the Lord takes pleasure in his people and he will beautify the humble with salvation. I can go on and on and on. The Lord made it invaluable, important to implement the, his importance of a humble heart because he knows people naturally don't like being told what to do. We're an independent people. If someone tells you what to do, the first thing you're going to do is go, huh? Here, watch this. And you do the exact opposite. You're laughing at me, yeah. What do you think would happen when Moses gave the law? He says, here's the law, thou shalt not. Boom, 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 boom. What did everybody do? Exactly the opposite. God knew that. 
He knows you know, people will want to be independent because of the fall of Adam and Eve. But to be dependent on Jesus, that takes me and your part to realize that. It's opposite of what your flesh brain tells you to do. Your body and your five senses are going to tell you, I can do this. You got to do this. You got to be a self-made person. You got to do this and go out. And Jesus is going, no, I already did do it. You follow me now. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. He didn't say my sheep hear my voice and I follow them. He said my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Jesus is the leader, not me and you. The sooner I figure that out, the better off I am. Stop being independent and start being God dependent. We're all in this together. I'm growing. We're learning and growing and growing. But, but the more I learn this and the more I realize this, I, like I said, it's getting better. I learn more. I get results. I get more confident. And you learn and you know, you know what? You don't have to go through everything the hard knocks way. You can learn the hard knocks way, and most of us do for a lot of stuff, but that's not God's plan A for you is to learn everything the absolute hardest way do you learn it. Just like any parent, he'd rather you learn the right way and let God fix the problems before you have the problem. <laughs> I think that's better. That's way better. All right. I'm going to stop there as everybody's we're full, filled up. We're going to go. I'll continue next week. But you know, a humble heart is one of the primary characteristics of a mature Christian. And that's what I like to seek. Moses was the humblest person on the planet, and that's a pretty good example. So was David. And there's many other characters in the Scripture. When you read through these stories, you'll all find out they all started by humbling their heart. Once they did that, God pushed them and moved them forward in their life and was able to accomplish what God wanted them to do. It all starts with raising our white flag up and saying, okay, I am not the brightest lamp on the box. God, what do you want me to do? Amen?